Thanks very much, Kevin and Sister Helen. Nice to have you back. I don't know what the title of that book would be, but boy, it'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Your life story. The Life and Times of the Duncans. Um, right, now what we're going to do, we're going to turn straight to James in chapter 3. I, think it's, I can't remember the last time I gave a Wednesday night talk, Kevin, so thank you for that. James chapter 3. I'd like to talk tonight about the small things make a big difference. Small things make a big difference. Um, this year we've got an exciting year ahead of us. We've already had a number of people baptised. Um, and let's make it that we can do the little things throughout this year that will make a difference for 22, for, for revival, for people getting established um, and just seeing things happening in our fellowship. James chapter 3, it says here in verse 3, it says, Behold, we, we put bits in horses' mouths so that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. So there's just massive horses that rely on a little bit uh, you know, the, uh, the plate that runs through their, along in their, inside their mouth, um, called a mullen, and uh, it controls the entire horse, the reins, etc., the bridle. And uh, I remember as a kid, my, my dad was a journalist, but he, um, uh, to get extra money on Wednesdays and Wednesday nights and holidays, would go to Malala and Strathalbyn to, to the trots and the horses and all that. And Saturdays, he would take us to the races, and um, we could pretend to put some money on some horses but I remember it's showing my age in 1968 first big event that I remember was the 1968 Melbourne Cup Rain Lover won by a massive margin and it talked about then he just the, the, the uh, jockey was able to control the horse to the last minute the, the trainer had only been a trainer registered for about four months it goes down in history has been one of the rare times when you get a trainer normally they're training for years Bart Cummings and owners and trainers that are getting the best in the industry this is one guy who'd only been trained for about four months. He said later on, if anybody told me then that I was going to win the Melbourne Cup as a trainer after four months, he said, he, I would have thought everybody was crazy. So he had Rain Lover. Then in 1969, Rain Lover won again. Uh, this great horse, this uh, thoroughbred. And so it's, it's nice to have a bit of fascination about horses and how they operate, particularly in some of the races. And growing up, we'd get out the, the TAB guide and look at the horses. <laughs> Who ever does that, by the way, is it? few of the old, uh, gamb not gamble, put a few few bob on which way and all that. <laughs> the old man would have his cigarette, you know, hang out, what do you want, giggle? So I don't want to put 20 cents on that race, Dad, roll around, and he'd just pick up a bit of paper and off the ground and pretend that it was my new guide. There you go, there's your ticket, and come back at the end of the race. No, you lost that one, get lost. And at the end of the, after eight races, you'd go back to dad and I want to put another 20 cents on and he always made sure that you got all your money back even though you'd, give you, you'd have, end up with two dollars at the end of the day just how you started but horses and this tiny little bit controlling the, the, the direction, the speed and the pace of these magnificent creatures called horses so this small thing making a big difference and then he goes on to say verse 4 behold also the ships which are which through, the, the, though they be great, are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Well, I remember the America's Cup. Who remembers that one? <laughs> you know, with our former late Prime Minister, Bob Hawke, who famously said, because the, the race had gone, no one had they'd been going since 1851, the America's Cup. For 131 years, no one had ever won that cup other than America. And in 1983, Australia won it. And it started off seven, at best of seven. The first two races, the Americans won. The third one, the Australian won. Uh, then, so then the fifth and fourth and fifth Australian ones again. And then they got to six races. And then the final one, the seventh race, was the big decide. And Australia got up and won by 42 seconds. And it, it was a worldwide phenomenon at that time. Everybody rem who remembers it? <laughs> and Bob Hawke saying, any boss... You remember that? The sacks his employees, well, da 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 da, he's a bad person. So basically, we all got a holiday. And he wanted to make it a national public holiday, good old Bob Hawke. And yet, it was at the helm, the, the captain 
of the boat was the helmsman and he had to control this massive yacht in those waters, the winds, the, the, the currents, everything's required to operate that magnificent yacht, the America's Cup and uh, America 2, I think the boat was called, and, and they won. And it went down in history as a great moment, a little thing controlling a big outcome. Let's go have a look in uh, Matthew in chapter 13. Matthew 13. There's a book that you can get called Cleopatra's Nose. It's, it's, it's a history book. And it tells history that small events having a big, m massive ramifications. It talks about Cleopatra's Nose. Back in the day, generals from all over these fierce armies had an infatuation about her nose this history and as a result of that it caused conflict with the Greeks the Egyptians and that world then and they call it it was a, a strange a strange shaped nose but as a result of that interest and ramific the ramifications that followed because people were caught up in it the Roman Empire they had this magnificent empire and the Senate decided one day that they were going to bring, introduce a tax on tin. But no one told them that every soldier had tiny little nails around the boot, in their, boot, their army boot. And as a result, that every soldier immediately was taxed. It caused a revolt amongst other things and it was one of the big things that brought down the Roman Empire on tiny little nails that were taxed by the soldiers who had defended the country. So little things can have, make a big difference. In Matthew chapter 13, and it says here, verse 31, um, another parable put it forth, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among the herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Likened unto the kingdom of God, this tiny little mustard seed. And it really says there is an ecosystem that's been created by the fowls of the air, the, the, the birds, etc., settling in amongst the trees and the branches, and it creates an ecosystem for that through that tree. And the kingdom of God is no different. It starts off with the smallest thing. Jesus Christ, in a sense, died on the cross in Jerusalem, on the other side of the world. And now that, that event, we know it's big, but in the eyes of many people prior to their conversion, it's a, it's a, a, no, a no event. Many people don't even care about it. But for the ones that impact on that crucifixion, the kingdom of God has circumnavigated the world with revival from people's lives being dramatically changed. And he likens it unto the kingdom of God, a little thing creating this massive great size of revival that we're part of now. Look at New Guinea as we know. And Pastor Godfrey, in a sense, fulfilled this, um, this scripture in, in amongst New Guinea when there was uh, a sick mother with cerebral malaria dying Pastor Godfrey's converted. He goes to visit his mother in Lumi, which is way out in the middle of nowhere. His mother is dying. He prays for her and she's healed. The next day, people saw the miracle and revival started. Nine people started that revival. I think there's one person still alive from that, that start of that great revival for him. A healing out in Lumi, which is way west of Port Moresby, up in the highlands, you can't get there, you can get on a four-seater plane, you can walk and it takes you 24 hours and there's this tiny little place that you have to search to find at Lumi and there's this woman the next day serving her son and all those that were interested in hearing the gospel. That was a little event, the kingdom of God. But look at the revival that's created and at the time Australia there was the territories with Australia were not allowed to get involved with the with the politically there was all sorts of trouble um, 
at the time so there was a number of years where Pastor Godfrey was on his own and then after a little while he made, finally made contact with uh, the folk in Australia and he had started reading Corinthians and, and initiated operating the spiritual gifts without any real direction other than the conversations that he had prior to leaving to go to Papua New Guinea but when he got back there it was all pretty isolated and one of the first gifts to come out that you've started a revival, a fire that's going to consume the whole nation that was one of the gifts that came out so the kingdom of God let's read it again is likened unto this tiny little events that you and I do that grow and verse 32 which indeed is the least of all the seeds the least little things that we do um, but when it has grown when it, it captivates the people that are around it that little bit of prayer that we've had for someone is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree that people talk about it grows the story grows so the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof in, in London many years ago guy by the name of John Kelly and Sandra Allen on a very cold Friday night were walking in Hemel Hempstead the outreach was over in they go to Burger King to get a hot chocolate going in and they just so happened to notice a guy kind of a little bit away from them walking down with his bit stooped and John says give me a, bro a leaflet he goes oh, hi we're about to have a hot chocolate would you like to join us? A tiny little thing of all the great things that happened in the kingdom of God. His name was Selwyn. Selwyn was heading to a bridge. He was a very successful businessman, but he got into gambling and he had the, lost the whole lot, lost his family, lost everything. He was heading to a bridge that day, that night, to jump off and kill himself. Hot chocolate brought him in. He hears the kingdom of God and spends the next 37 years spirit-filled, baptised in our fellowship, fell asleep in the Lord a couple of years ago. And that's great, isn't it? You know, the little things that we can do, that we do do, that's what it's like and unto. And all the people said. John chapter 9. John chapter 9. So we'll keep doing what we're good at. The little things. That's what we are as a church. So this story here, just, just to keep it brief, this man is healed of blindness. There's a, a, an interrogation. Uh, the family brought in, and there's a whole lot of uh, incredible disbelieving people and dishonest, hardened people that are really not embracing this victory that this man has received. He's been healed of blindness. But just one part of the story I want us to really look at here tonight is just in verse... 35 he's cast out Jesus hears that they had cast him out and what did he do a tiny little thing in the story when he found him he went looking for him and isn't that what we're good at doing when people come into our meeting aren't we good at finding out where they're at what they're how'd you go did you enjoy the meeting through the week we go visit our, our friends that have come along here and tonight, if you're listening at home, we would like you to know how you're going. What have you been up? How, how's the meeting been for you? So a little part of the story, and Jesus has gone hunting for him. He said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus could have healed this man, and he would have had no idea, after all the torment that he'd gone through, to, to justify all I know is this guy prayed for me and I was healed. I was blind. I don't know what he looks like. I couldn't see him. The parents have disowned him pretty well. He's been kicked out of his synagogue, all his basic structure, infrastructure, family life, and the support base that he may have once had is now kaput. And he's on his own. Jesus hears about it. Where is he? And that's what we do as a fellowship. That's what we're good at. And found him and said, Dost thou believe? And he answered that I'm verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talks with you. It's me. And he said, Lord, I believe. 
And what did he do? He worshipped the Son of God. Now that's a tree. That's a revival. From a little thing of trying to find out where he's at. And we have gone down in the ages of our fellowship. But in the Fiji assembly, they were right at the very, very beginning, talking to the guys at the time, there was two of them in a chicken den playing chorus and they just said look if what we're doing is of God we're going to see revival and look at the Fiji assembly now so the small things that we do just playing a guitar or, or talking to people about the Lord has given great occasion to our fellowships around the world and long may it last that we do that with our people we're not we don't compete with the grandiose of so-called Christendom Pentecostals churches and all that where they they make their millions on music, etc. And whatever they're doing, they're doing. That's over there. But our part of the vineyard is that we do the small things that matter. And, and that's what Jesus is saying causes a revival. Back in 2000, there was a guy, year 2000, there was a guy by the name of Ted and Maureen Sweeney that were being interviewed. And they are recounting a story that had happened 55 years earlier, 56 years earlier. They were on a, a, a lighthouse on the west coast of Ireland. They had reported some bad weather. Uh, the weather that he had reported about was gale force winds. Um, he had spoken of um, that the whole of the coast along the, uh, the European coast was going to be hit with a massive storm, gale force winds, and he put that through to a place called Dunstable in England. He gets a reply back, are you sure? Falling barometer, deep depression between Iceland and Scotland, gale force winds, low cloud, heavy showers, yep, typical day in England actually, when I think about it. Um, for, go, for, six winds he gets a message repeat 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 are you sure and he's recounting how him and his wife um, just putting in a, 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 the update of some weather from Ireland to Dunstable and on to, on to London at that time he didn't know that General Eisenhower was contemplating D-Day and it was postponed 24 hours because of his tiny little input, small input on the weather pattern of that day. General Eisenhower said later on, it averted the greatest military disaster in the history of mankind, that little thing that he did. And the next day, 24 hours later, the largest amphibious invasion amphibious invasion in the history of warfare, Operation Overlord, um, five assault beaches, two million troops by August on the west side of Europe, 18,000 paratroopers, 14,000 sorties, 156,000 ground troops, 7,000 naval vessels were all told, halt, wait. All the years, starting in 1942, the birth of D-Day, where they had to break on the west side of Europe to break up the um, war that was going on at the time there. And Ted and Maureen Sweeney, having no idea this top secret military plan, all they did was faithful to their lighthouse job to report on some weather patterns. The things that we do, we don't know the impact when John and Sandra offered that cup of hot chocolate to Selwyn, they averted a disaster and saved his life and gave him 37 years of walking with the Lord. The things that we do, occasionally, the Lord will give us a, a bit of an idea of the impact and the, and the magnitude by which we've saved a life, turned a person's life around. When uh, we do that, we rejoice. But a lot of time we don't find out. So the Lord says, when I come again, will I find faith on the earth? The little things that we do, 
faithful things that we're good at doing will he find those things upon the face of the earth and i think in our fellowship yes he will let's continue on this year to do the little things that matter in people's lives and 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 make ourselves available to our neighbors and friends knowing that god is watching over what we do we don't know at, at times what good we've done and i said just a moment ago we occasionally get a full glimpse of how much we've helped a person's life and it makes us feel good and that happens time and time again they didn't know for 56 years when the secret secret things were revealed and now they're old old couple and they recalled the day we thought we'd done something wrong are you sure are you sure repeat 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 not knowing the impact of one of the greatest military successes in our history the d-day landing so it does make a difference and all the people said let's go shall we and we'll just have a look at one little other example go to first kings in chapter 18 probably know this story very well first kings 18 And in verse 44, this is the rain. And it came to pass at the seventh time, now he's up, has a look to see this cloud, and it said, Behold, there arises a cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. We know the ocean, we're looking down there now, because if we could just see a cloud, there's some big clouds that way actually, but a tiny little cloud to our west and out of the sea like a man's head and he said go up and say unto Ahab prepare thy chariot get thee down that their rain stop thee not he just knew after all those three years nearly whatever it was two years and three months or three years of drought and it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heavens were black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Right? Uh, Elijah was a faster runner. He just saw the blessing and just ran with the victory of what had happened. Cloud, tiny little cloud. So if you've got a, you need a victory in your life, sometimes it's just a little cloud. Uh, uh, Vicky and Dan, when Kai was born, insurmountable stuff that they'll continue with and dealing with and uh, medical terminology and information overload it was overwhelming and on top of a bit of sleep deprivation and it's a busy difficult time for them and what did they do they broke it down in increments little things so like yeah let's get that victory let's get that victory and now we've got a very healthy young a grandson or they've got a healthy son so if you've got a insurmountable things in your life, break it down. Size of a man's hand type of thing and see what God does. He's good at doing that for us. And, and let the Lord bless all that we're doing this year and all the people said. I think we'll leave it there. Thanks, Kev. Over to you.